The intention of this video is to be an introduction to the Blink Script node and uh, Blink scripting in general. Um, if you're coming at this from an absolutely uh, blank, zero experience with Blink Script, don't even know what the node is before, that's perfect. That's exactly where we're starting from with this. I'm also specifically tailoring this to a sort of artist perspective towards Blink Script. So if you perhaps uh, got a background in computer science or you're a comp engineer or a comp TD, then it's possible um, this may in some areas be uh, perhaps a little bit rudimentary for you, but I think this will still at least be a great springboard to accelerate you into uh, just that initial friction with Blink Script. So what exactly is Blink Script? The official, slightly less artist friendly description for Blink Script on the uh, Foundry Blink Reference Guide is The Foundry's Blink is a C like language designed for rapid image processing. It uses standard C syntax with a few keyword changes. Um, the way I would describe it from an artist's perspective is that um, Blink Script acts as the bridge for being able to write directly to pixels. So if you're familiar with uh, working with Python, you'll know that um, using Python in Nuke generally takes the form of perhaps uh, navigating the node graph, dealing with um, file paths and things, changing, um, doing batch changes on uh, knob settings on nodes, automating things, stuff like that. And it's less about actually affecting the pixel. Similarly, Nuke's expression node kind of works the other way around, where it's very, very good for immediately changing the values on pixels, but it's less about actually um, having that programmatic approach. For example, you can't loop over pixels or create huge amounts of variables that all talk to each other. It's got that limitation of about four um, in the top. So. Let's jump into a few examples of where I've used Blink Script for various different tools and uh, why I've used Blink Script for them, and then we'll jump into uh, getting started. So I've got three tools here that I use Blink Script for um, because I really couldn't do these tools any other way. I had to use Blink Script for them. So the three of them are uh, Godray's Projector, Chromatic Blink, and Radial Dilate. So let's just jump in to see what they do. Godray's Projector is a tool that allows you to using two cameras, uh, one to view through and the other sort of like a projector, you can create a, uh, a God rays like effect within a, um, a region that we're viewing. So if I just set this uh, to more of a default uh, look, just give me a second, you can kind of see what's going on here. So if we just give this a second to process, you can see that it's generating these, um, it's generating lots and lots of different versions of the input image, this noise, in order to then uh, sort of average them together and create this sort of box of uh, fog. It's a sort of 3D version of the God Race tool. And so um, the kind of processes that Blink Script's being used for here is to loop for every single one of these steps. Additionally, it's um, doing some translation based on some internal uh, maths using uh, the two cameras positions and rotations and fields of view in order to um, generate this image. This is perhaps a little bit too complicated to jump into the uh, the inner workings of, but the, the concept is there. Similarly, I have a tool here called Chromatic Blink. So the process this is doing is sort of an iterative ST map effect where I've got my, uh, my ST map here and I'm applying uh, a transformation to it. And then what the Blink Script node is doing is it's iterating between these two ST maps in order to generate these uh, cool effects. And the reason it's got two is so that you can affect the uh, the in and out separately and get all of those interesting results. Additionally, you can see that this is responding really quite quickly. And that's because Blink Script enables you to actually write your, uh, write your script to be able to run on the GPU. By running on the GPU, it means that um, the whole image can be processed in, uh, much faster as GPUs are kind of built for this um, entire screen wide uh, sort of parallel operations. Um, and then finally, there's a tool here called Radial Dilate. And this is a, uh, a radial version of Nuke's um, standard erode fast node. 
which uh, allows you to dilate your image in and out with a sort of very square filter. Radial dilate does the exact same operation, but with a, uh, a radial filter. So you can see that um, the world is your oyster once you really start diving into the um, into the world of Blink Script. Uh, you you can write whatever pixels you want as long as you can uh, if you can think it, you can blink it. I think I said once and. Uh, uh, that uh, that quote is as true as it is cringeworthy. So let's jump into actually using the Blink Script node. What I'm going to do is I am going to just type uh, Blink Script here and bring in the blank Blink Script node. And then the main thing that we're going to be interfacing with is this kernel source tab here. And this is just where all of our script is written and you can see that this doesn't come in blank by default this actually comes in with a uh, pre-written example so let's uh show you what that example actually is because it's it's good to be able to go in see the example and use it by default it is a, a saturation kernel so you can see here i'm able to pull and push my saturation here and this saturation is uh, a sort of uh, a replica of the, uh, the Nuke saturation node. Uh, internally, they are using the same maths. However, unless every single Blink project that you're going to be doing is a saturation node, uh, this default should probably uh, be replaced. So how do we do that? Well, in order to do it, we really have to go in and see what each of these segments is doing and um, determine what we want to keep and what we want to get rid of. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna control double click on this to bring it up full screen. And we're just gonna go through this sort of um, almost line by line, say what's happening and uh, what we need. Uh, rather conveniently, this has been commented, which is great, but uh, let's go through this anyway. So at the top here, you can see that uh, this is calling itself uh, a kernel and the kernel's name is saturation kernel. Uh, so this is already something that uh, we perhaps don't want to have as our default because again we don't want it to load in with that name. So I'm just going to perhaps call this a uh, blank kernel so that um, we know when this loads up that this is blank. Um, the image computation kernel uh, is set to pixel wise. There are two options that could be here, E pixel wise and E component wise. Already this sounds a little bit unfamiliar and overwhelming. Uh, the way I like to think about this is pixel wise, we'll go through the image uh, with each pixel and you can call each of your red, green, blue and alpha channels individually and mix and match them. The alternative, which is E component wise, will run your script on a channel by channel basis. So it will run for your, your red channel, then your green channel, then your blue channel, then your alpha channel. Very rarely do I find myself in a situation where my scripts uh, don't uh, have channels communicating with each other. So I like to leave pixel wise as my default. Here we have um, the image section where we are uh, reading in our source image, which is the input. And we have the DST, so our, our, our output image. I, uh, again, the default on this is fine and we're gonna talk a little bit more about these options here later. Next, we have the parameter section. Now the parameter section um, is where the actual sort of sliders and, and boxes and knobs that the, uh, the user will actually change and access is available. So uh, for now, if we were creating a default tool, we would actually have this be blank. So I'm going to get rid of this. Now the local section, this is where um, the variables that the uh, user aren't going to be uh, aren't going to be interacting with, um, just the things that you need for the, the processing and calculation in the background. Again, by default, we don't need any of these. The uh, the define section that is where we uh, define uh, the name and default values of our parameters. Again, by default, if we have no parameters we have no need to define them. Now, uh, the init section, this is the stuff that will run uh, before the actual rest of the script. This is the, um, this is the initialization of everything. 
And again, if there's nothing to initialize by default, which there isn't, we don't need this bit. Um, next up, we uh, have our actual process section here. Now this is where um, the this is where the magic happens. Um, uh, sort of ninety percent of the code I write will end up in this section because this is uh, where we actually define um, everything that happens within the script, all of the expressions, all of the looping, all of the you know even writing the final image in this line here happens within the actual process. So again, we don't need uh, this line here. Um, we don't need to handle any of this stuff. We don't need to be calculate the uh, the luminance of what we're working with, nor do we need to apply the saturation. And finally, we don't need this line in this form. By default, I like to have my, uh, my sort of blank blink script node just output the input. And the way we're gonna do that, and we're actually gonna write our first bit of blink script together here now, is we can see up here that our image is named SRC, short for source. And now we're gonna say that our source, and remember to put the brackets at the end, is uh, equal to our destination, or our destination now equals our source. And now when we click recompile on this, you can see this has changed to blank kernel. We have no kernel parameters available. And now when we view this node, the, uh, the output is equal to the input. And then what I would recommend you do is I uh, would recommend that you go and create a new tool set for this and perhaps let's call this blank blink script. And um, that's what I always do. I've got um, one here, one for uh, one for demo purposes and one for uh, using. But there we are. So this now, uh, it's not a very impressive blink script, but it is a functional blink script. And um, that is an achievement all on its own. Now, in order to actually get into moving forward and creating uh, any kind of blink script that your, your mind can imagine, we first have to talk about all of the different variable types that we have within blink script. When jumping into the blink script variables, it can initially seem a little bit overwhelming, which is why I've done a side-by-side -side comparison between the blink script variables and um, variables and sliders that you've probably used almost every day in your uh, normal Nuke day-to-day -day operation. So let's jump in to this little blink script I put together, which uh, has an example of all of the variables you could possibly need. So let's start from the top. Um, I put these into the parameter section because these are variables that our user will be exposed to. Um, and just a little teaser as to what that is all going to look like, you can see it here. Additionally, there are a couple of variable types that are in the local section because these do not actually have a, a user facing uh, representing knob. So let's start from the top. The first one is a uh, is bool. Now uh, you'll know if you've ever typed a variable um, a variable type correctly or incorrectly because it will turn blue. Now those of you familiar with Python will be used to uh, when you write a variable type. For example, if you were to write a string, you would just do something like my string equals and then you would put it in quotes and say words and Python will see that, pick it up and understand it. In Blink Script, because it's a, uh, a C++ similar language, you have to specify the type of every single variable. And that uh, comes with lots of gotchas later down the line, but it is what it is. So remember, if you think you've typed it right, but it's not blue, you haven't. And so what we've got here is we've got our variable name, or our variable type, sorry, and our variable name next to it. So the first one is bool, which is a boolean. Now this just normally takes the form of a standard checkbox like this. Uh, we use these all the times for uh, disables and things like that. Um, we've got int, um, which is just a single box with an integer in it. No decimals to be seen here. Int two um, is the same as int but uh, it comes with two settings. So this can be good for, um, and I've got some 
nuke native examples of all of these later just to clear it up but this can be good for uh, uv grids and things like that int three um you might be seeing a pattern here uh, it's just three integers altogether so that can be good for when you're dealing with things like um, uh, xyz in 3d space um, if you had to define something with an integer in in that world instead of as a decimal you can and then int four um, is the same thing uh, it's, um, but with four variables uh, now float i uh, use these all of the time because the float options are not only great for sliders but float three and float four um, and we'll get onto this in a second often take the form of uh, color inputs so standard float slider it could be anything it could be uh, the uh, a multiply on a gain operation or a grade operation um, it could be uh, anything floating point sliders are everywhere uh, float 2 this can be really great for dealing with pixels on the screen um, as they often come as a uh, a decimal you know when you do uh, when you do a transform for example that um, has the option to work with decimals that's what filtering is all about float three um, float three uh, takes the form of this sort of XYZ looking thing but um, if we were to for example create a color wheel and set this to be RGB uh, not a color wheel sorry a constant and set this to be RGB, which it is by default, that has got these three XYZ values. And then finally, float four, uh, and I think float four is probably one of the most powerful variables available. Um, float four is um, great for RGBA, and by default, it even comes in as an RGBA slider, which is fantastic. Now, this is where it gets a little bit exciting. Now we have float three by three and float four by four there. That's very tricky to say. Um, and these uh, take the form of these sort of grid layouts. These are our matrixes. Um, now these have uh, plenty of great uses as well that we will get onto in a second. And then finally, we've got um, our array options. Uh, you'll see these uh, brackets exist here. They can also take the form of um, they don't have to be double brackets. They can be single brackets. So for example, I could call this second array and then uh, you can put square brackets like this and then the numbers in the boxes specify the items in the list. So for example, if I did array 12 here, that will have um, 12 boxes inside of it um, or uh, two by three, uh, you can, these multiply together. So this, for example, would be uh, six. Now, um, these don't have a human inter uh, interface option here. Uh, these often just exist in the background, but these can be absolutely amazing. Uh, for example, if you wanted to do something that um, sorted all of the pixels on your screen, you could store them all in a sort of XY array like this, uh, and then run a process that would sort them by a value, reshuffle that array, and then um, output that difference. Now, when you view it like this, it can all seem a little bit frightening. However, um, most of these options do actually have uh, a nuke equivalent on the menu. So let me just pop that up now. And you can see um, these are just using uh, nuke user knobs and they all have got um, a familiar look to them. So when you start to see them side by side, they seem a little bit less frightening and a little bit more uh, familiar. Now I'm just gonna go through a few of uh, Nuke's native nodes to look at all of the different variable types so that we can uh, see them in a familiar context. So for example, on the grade node, if we were to be building this with Blink Script, uh, a Boolean might be our, our black clamp buttons or white clamp buttons. Um, a single float variable might be our various different gain sliders. Uh, a standard float variable might be uh, this luminance slider or the, the mix slider. And then uh, these are all float four variables because they have four parameters to them. Now our float two could be really great for a corner pin because although these, when you move them by default, do round to the nearest integer, they can accept decimal values to be uh, in between pixels 
A float three, and I touched on this before, um, would be an RGB constant. A standard int would be uh, specifying the UDIM uh, on a UV tile node, and then the U and V, because these are always absolute, they're not decimals, um, would be uh, an int two. You could store this as a single variable. And then a float three by three would be great for making an internal color matrix. This can be really great when dealing with uh, data passes, for example, position passes or normal passes from CG. And then uh, the matrix by default loads in as a three by three. But when you create a matrix node, just like we did before, you can create these to be any size. So if you wanted to do a matrix operation, which it can be very important when you're dealing with filtering, this uh, is the variable for you. But uh, there we go. So we've created a blank blink script node. We've kind of explained um, what can be possible, why a blink script is useful and the, the niche that it occupies and has a sort of unique uh, dominion over and we've also talked about the variables that you can use in order to work with a great blink script. Now uh, the, the the second part of this is going to be going from zero to a finished blink script project. We're going to do a very simple uh, defocus tool that you can control with an input image.